Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome in. Welcome back to another episode of Format Podcast Live. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, whenever you uh, whenever you get here, make sure you uh, go ahead and uh, let us know in the chat where you're coming in from and uh, make sure you hit that like button. Appreciate it. Um, so we are going to go ahead and let's take a couple minutes, see if we get a couple people in the chat and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. So got a pretty interesting show for you here today. Got, uh, as you can see, got some uh, interesting topics. This is going to be uh, pretty much all NBA here. And uh, obviously the NBA playoffs started today. So um, that's going to be that's going to be interesting. And that's going to be the focus of a lot of the sports talk for the next, I guess, two months or whatever. But um, definitely got some interesting topics today and and looking forward to discussing those with you. Uh, make sure if you hopping in. Um, that you let us know where you're coming in from and make sure you hit that like really appreciate it um all right so the first uh well matter of fact before we get started uh you know what time it is let's make sure we do this and knock out the particulars then we'll get started if you're here on youtube and you haven't already please make sure you go ahead click that like that subscribe that notification bell make sure you're kept up to date whenever we drop new content on the channel if you want the audio only version of the podcast open up your audio podcast platform hit the search bar type in the format podcast and we should come right up if you're enjoying the content make sure you give us that like that five star review and drop a comment all that stuff helps us rise in the algorithm helps us find more sports fans helps more sports fans find us and finally make sure you write it down put it in your phone set an alarm do whatever you got to do to remember saturday nights at 7 p.m we are live here on the format podcast and we'll give you the opportunity to call in talk to us get at me i love it i can't wait all right so let's go ahead and uh we'll start off with uh jante porter and um if, if you uh, know anything about the nba or you've been paying attention to um sports media over the last week or so you will realize that he is um a toronto raptors player and he's been banned for life from the nba for gambling <laughs> so uh, let me let me start to break all this down right so first and foremost right i consume a ton of sports media so part of that is um obviously having gone to school for journalism and and done that um as a profession um part of that is i really enjoy a lot of the sports media talk shows part of that is getting all the information that i can whether it's reading stuff whether listening to stuff hearing other journalists hearing other opinionists etc i consume a ton of sports media and one of the things that i've been noticing lately and it kind of <sighs> I'm not going to say, it. well, it, it irks me a bit, but it is what it is. So I, I learned, you know, you got to deal with that. It seems like a ton of these shows are sponsored by these gambling companies, right? That's what you hear all the time. Um, and it seems like a ton of these shows either have some sort of gambling segments, uh, either weekly or even some of them have uh, gambling segments daily, right? And we know that uh, the, the major sports leagues, they're all in bed with the gambling companies and they just, they make tons of money. We know this. And it's funny because in the past, sports gambling was a hush-hush thing. If you wanted to bet on a game um, in just about every state, it was illegal. So you had to have a bookie under the table. The mob made a ton of money um, off of uh, illegal sports gambling, et cetera. And so, you know, that's not something that leagues would ever openly um, get involved with. But now they all are, right? And it's crazy. Every league, including even pro freaking wrestling. And let me just digress a second. How do you bet on something that you know has a predetermined outcome, right? So we know pro wrestling is um I'm not going to say fake because people still get hurt, but we know that it is uh scripted. And so if you know that pro wrestling has a predetermined outcome, how can you gamble on that? You do that, you're a real degenerate, plain and simple. You, you just got to gamble. And it's wild. But anyway, um some of the big gambling companies are what? FanDuel, DraftKings, ESPN bet, Fox bet, bet 365, Caesars, bet rivers, fanatics. All these are major gambling companies and a ton of them, um, support, uh, uh, 
all these um, sports shows and uh, who knows, maybe one day they'll, they'll support this show or a uh, sponsor, I should say, but they do that. And um, it's, it's just wild, right? So all these leagues, they're making a ton of money off this gambling stuff. And here's the thing though, every league makes it a point to tell their players that they cannot bet on their sport and that they shouldn't even bet inside at all in inside the facilities, I should say. And that like, that's a big one in the NFL. Like, even if you're going to bet, if it's not on football, don't even bet at all inside the facility. Just, just keep it clean. Right. And now you got a lot of people I've heard and they'll say, well, um, uh, the leagues are working with the gambling companies. So, so why can't, why can't the employees bet? And to that, I say, so what the leagues are working with the gambling companies It's very simple. It's the golden rule, right? He who has the gold makes the rules. It's that simple. Um, they can tell their employees not to do that, right? If they have a company and part of their company's bylaws and guidelines are you will not do such and such, then you will not do such and such, or you don't have to work here. It's pretty simple to me, right? It's not an illegal order. It's not infringing on anyone's constitutional rights. If you don't want to adhere to the rules and you don't have to be an athlete in that league. It's that simple. If the if the if the company says or if the league, if the NFL says, yo, you won't bet on football, you won't bet inside the facility. Either adhere to those rules or don't be in the NFL. This is not that hard to me. Now, maybe it's because I don't gamble, but I don't see that as being a big deal at all. Just follow the damn rules and go on with your career. But, you know, for some people, that's clearly too hard. Right. So in the NBA, the big thing right now is the story about uh, Raptors player John Tay Porter. He got the hammer laid down with a lifetime ban. So here's the details, right? Let, let's go ahead and get into that. Um, John Tay Porter, he's a, he was a two-way player under contract with the Toronto Raptors, and he's been banned for life from the NBA due to some serious violations of league rules. And here's some of the details of that ban. So one, disclosure of confidential information. So prior to the Raptors game on March 20th, uh, John Tay Porter disclosed confident, confidential excuse me, information about his own health status to an individual he knew to be an NBA better. And this uh, compromised the integrity of the game. So if now I know that um, John Tay Porter's injured, I can bet on the over under of maybe how many points he's going to score, how many minutes he's going to play, because it's wild how many different prop bets you can make on all these different things. But that's a whole nother story, right? Um, another violation is manipulating game participation in the same March 20th game Porter limited his own participation to influence the outcome of one or more bets on his performance he played only three minutes claiming that he felt ill so that was one of those things that I was talking about where it goes to that whole thing of um you know over under minutes or over under uh points scored or rebounds or what have you all those prop bets right so he was manipulating that and controlling it okay cool Betting on NBA games is the third thing. While traveling with the Raptors or the Raptors 905, which is the Toronto Raptors NBA G League affiliate, um, DeJounte Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games using an associate's online betting account. These bets range in size from $15 to $22,000, totaling $54,094. The net winnings from those bets were $21,965. <sighs> So <laughs> you basically lost over 30 G's gambling. Okay, whatever. You know, part of gambling is losing. That happens, right? All right, here's the next thing. Suspicious betting activity. Now, mind you, all these different subsections I'm reading you, all those are violations of league rules, okay? Suspicious betting activity. The suspicious bets related to Porter's performance in the March 20th game were brought to the NBA's attention by licensed sports betting operators and an organization monitoring legal betting markets. The $80,000 prop bet on Porter's underperformance was frozen and not paid out due to the unusual betting activity. And finally, ongoing investigation. The NBA's investigation remains open and further findings may emerge. The league has also shared information with federal prosecutors regarding this matter. Okay. Um, def definitely, Sneed. Uh, I'm, I'm with you, man. I, I just, I, I don't even get it. It's, it's not that serious. But again, you know, if you're not a gambler like myself, I'm not a gambler. I can't understand how, um, you know, it's that important to you that you have to do something this stupid. And yeah, to your point, absolutely. People are watching this. There are people who literally get paid just to study this and look at this and find anomalies and whatnot. And one of the biggest things there, remember, uh, I just read to you, 
uh, the eighty thousand dollar prop bet on Porter's underperformance was frozen, so they didn't want to pay out that people made money off of this, right? So they said, "Wait a minute, we don't want to pay this money out. We got to investigate what's going on here." And eventually, the guy gets busted, right? Now, what's so interesting about this whole thing? No one would even know who this cat is if it wasn't for this whole scandal. And I'm okay. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know every player on every roster, right? However. I had no idea that Michael Porter Jr. had a brother in the league before this. I didn't know that. That's crazy. <laughs> and so I used I used the word degenerate before. Right. And I know as a journalist, it's not cool to call people names and whatnot. And you, you probably shouldn't do that. It's unprofessional. But the fact is this. John T. Porter clearly is a degenerate gambler. There's no question about that. He literally sacrificed an NBA career, an NBA career. OK, listen to this. His career earnings were. $2.4 million and he lost it to win $22,000 gambling? Like, are we serious here? Who does that? Who does that? You sacrifice an NBA career in which you've made $2.4 million. Now, I know that's peanuts in terms of NBA money, but that's more money than the vast majority of Americans will ever see in their lifetime. And you blew that for winning $22,000. Come on, man. Now, for me, I really don't care. Because if you're willing to throw away a career that most people freaking dream of, dream of over making some bets, well, I mean, that's on you, right? You knew you were wrong because the way you went about it, the way you went about it, right? Because he he made a bunch of bets from an associate's online gambling account. So he knew that he wasn't supposed to do that, right? He also tried to basically uh, fix the bet by um, having people bet and bet himself on uh, how long he would play in a particular game and whatnot. And so he tried to fix the conditions of the bet. So he knew what he was doing was wrong. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? And um, for me, you do all this stuff, you deserve what you get. It's that simple. Because, <laughs> I mean, again, $2.4 million to win 22000 That doesn't even make sense. That's more than 10 times that amount. It really doesn't make sense. I can't. I can't get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Whatever he gets is deserved. And he got what he deserved, right? He got that lifetime ban. And now, you know what? Here's the other thing about that, Sneed. And, and it's crazy because this is a dude that, remember, we talked about it. Michael Porter Jr., his big brother, is in the NBA. So he's not hurting for money. He's made a little bit of money himself in the NBA. He's not hurting for dope. So what does he need to be doing here making all these stupid bets? Just being dumb. That, that's his problem, right? But here's the bigger question, though. I thought about this in regards to this story as well. And this is something that really I'm, I'm just not sure about. It's kind of bugging me out, and I'm really trying to figure out what the deal is, right? Um, if this was a player with more notoriety in the league, right, uh, a bigger name player, and I really wondered this, uh, dare I say, like a star, not a young star, like like a John Morant or a uh, um, uh, Ant Edwards, because these guys are still young and if 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 it would be uh, something along the lines of um, a young player like that, that really hasn't completely cemented themselves as a great in the league, you can get along without him if you should lose him. Right. But you you ask, what if it was a I'm just going to use a name. I'm not saying he does this, but a Kevin Durant. Right. And so I didn't want to use LeBron because he's the biggest name in the league. And for all of me getting on LeBron and giving him a hard time. LeBron has been flawless in terms of keeping himself out of off the court issues for his entire 21 year career. So I, I would never be so disrespectful as to even put him in something like this. And I'm again, I'm not saying that Kevin Durant does this. I'm just I just use his name because he's a future Hall of Famer. He's a big time uh, star major player uh, currently. So let, let's just use him as an example. What what would what would the NBA do? if it was a major player in this situation? That's my question, right? And um, my question, how would the league office handle that, right? Could they afford to react as heavily, right? Could they be as heavy handed with a player of that ilk? Uh, a Kevin Durant, a Steph Curry, um, a Devin Booker, you know, one of the big name guys, a Luca, something like that. Could they come down the way they came down with Jonte Porter? I don't know. It seems like, um, John T. Porter, it was very easy in terms of him because his name is not big. So they can make an example and say, anybody who does this, this is what it's going to be. But 
if it was a bigger name person, somebody who really moves the needle and who really uh, uh, moves a lot of merchandise and moves a lot of money, what would they do? Ah, uh, this is interesting. Okay, would do how they did Michael's silent ban, make him step away for a couple of years. That, hmm, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Yeah, I guess that's probably how they would have to go go about it. Um, thank you, Sneed. That was that was definitely a good comment. I didn't think about it that way. I I had just been thinking like you know, um, it's almost like if a certain superstar player who has been um, uh, circumstantially linked with PED use. If they were ever to get busted with that, how would the league handle it? Right. So, you know, you always wonder, man, when it comes to the big name people, you always wonder what would the league do? I guess the silent ban would be it. But I mean, could yeah, I, I, I guess you would have to do it silently because you would want to make an example, but you got to use a smaller name to do it. All right. So um, that, that's the first topic, John T. Porter. So what I want to do is um, I want to go I only got five in here, but, but that's all right. Oh, if you're in here, make sure you uh, hit that like button for me, please. But um, if you're listening and you have thoughts on this topic, John T. Porter band and um, how you feel about um, how you feel about uh, the league being in bed with with all these um, gambling companies, but not allowing their players to do it. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, give, in, give, in, uh, give, give me a call and let's hear what you have to say about this topic. I'm, I'm definitely interested to hear if anyone has anything to say about it. Numbers 904-219-8264. You can see it right there on the bottom of your screen. Problem today is a media, a different culture for the media. Everyone makes a name for themselves and expose major dirt, whistleblowing type stuff. Yeah, no. Well, so Sneed, um, as someone who obviously um, studied media in school and studied journalism and all that, I don't think that's a problem of today, right? One of the biggest stories in the, in the history of our country when it comes to media was what? Uh, Watergate, right? And that was 1972, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Richard Nixon. And so the whistleblower stuff has been going on for quite some time. So that's one of the biggest ways to make your name if you're a journalist is to um, to blow a big story. So I don't know if it's... Yes, the culture for the media is definitely different today because there's so many more, um, so many different uh, availabilities of outlets and ways to get your stuff out there. And um, maybe some people would say that it's even a little bit more loose in terms of um, vetting information and all of that because it's so it's so quick to uh, what is it to to be the first instead of get it right, um, right? But it was easier to cover before there are cameras everywhere now. No, that that's a great point. There are cameras everywhere now. Definitely agree with you. I'd say I'd say it's harder to get away with anything because, like you said, there's cameras everywhere now, whether or not it's uh, CCTV by the state or by the city or by the government or whether it's people with their mobile phones. It's really hard to get away with everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, doesn't look like there's any uh, uh, calls on that topic. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and move to the next topic, and that is Zion Williamson. So I definitely had some thoughts after watching him the other night. And um, I guess my first question when it comes to Zion is, what's the future for Zion? What does that look like? Well, this big now. The iPhone is going to explode gate tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I guess my question was, what's the future for Zion look like, right? So Zion Williamson was, he was the subject of, a whole lot of drama before this season even began, right? Last off season. Um, he had a lot of drama in his personal life, which look, I really don't care about any of that because he didn't commit any crimes. So it's not newsworthy to me. And this is not entertainment tonight. So it's not my place to get into any talking about talking about Zion Williamson and his personal life. Don't care about any of that. You want to, you want to find out about that. I'm sure you can look it up and whatever. All right, cool. Um, the bigger issues for me anyway, and I think for most actual basketball fans were the reports that he didn't take expanding his game seriously enough. Also, there were the reports that he didn't take his nutrition and his fitness seriously enough. And that that was leading to a ton of injuries and keeping him off of the court. Right. And we'll, we'll talk about just how much he was off the court in a minute, but, um, Zion Williamson, man, he's amazing. And he's got a somewhat unique build and something of a unique play style in the, in the modern NBA and the way he plays, he just, he consistently generates a tremendous amount of explosiveness and a tremendous amount of force. And they always talk about at his size and weight and with the build that he has, 
that's part of the reason why diet and fitness is such a big deal um, to uh, his uh, diet and fitness is such a huge deal in terms of uh, being the type of player that he maybe has the ability to to become. Right. And so here's the thing. Right. I was actually looking this up and it's crazy. In his first four seasons, Zion Williamson played one hundred and fourteen out of three hundred and twenty eight possible NBA games. That's bad. And I think before this season, was it last summer they gave him they gave him the max deal? Was it the two hundred thirty mil? Which I definitely wouldn't have given him. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, I'm I'm one of these owners, man. Before I give up this big money, you got to prove it to me. You got to show me. I'm not with that at all. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think a lot of people are under the impression that if he took better care of his body, he'd have been able to play more, and that's probably a fair assumption, right? And um. What's up, Mel? What's up, man? Down Sports. Definitely glad to have you here. Zion's future is to continue to get in shape and stay in shape, but uh, Pelican's future should be to get as much, <laughs> as much for him in the trade as possible. Yeah, I, I think so. I don't think that he's the future there. Um, I'm not so sure that he wants to be there. There were reports about that. Obviously, he has to be the good soldier if he wants to get traded someplace good. He can't be a malcontent and all that, but that's a different story. But yeah, um, uh, many people believe that uh, if Zion took better care of his body, he'd have been able to play more. He wouldn't have missed all this time. Um, now, that third season missing the foot injury, I don't know if I completely attribute it to that. Um, I will say, uh, if we look back, Michael Jordan broke his foot in, what, 1985-86 in that second season. And obviously, he was nowhere near the type of build that Zion Williamson was. But anyway, the point is... Um, the foot, in, the foot thing, that could happen to anyone. That could be a freak injury. But on the whole, I think that he needed to do better in terms of taking care of his body and the weight and all that. And that could help him uh, be uh, healthier and stay on the floor and play more games, right? Now, this season, Zion bounced back, played a career-high 70 games, which that's awesome. And like I said before, the guy is exceptionally explosive to the point that a lot of people say, and this is where I'm about to get irritated, a lot of people say that um, we've never seen a player like him before. All right. Old head hater alert. Old head hater alert. So, uh, um, anybody ever hear of a guy named, uh, and Elijah Wan. Oh, this guy, That's Charles Barkley. The, NBA, yeah. what it is today. the best sport in the world. So uh, my man Sneed says we have seen players like him before, and that that's exactly it. And actually, when I was prepping this and I was uh, going through and thinking about other players, I, I should have said young Larry Johnson before his back got hurt. That's another guy who was, um, you know, along the same lines as that type of player. And um, but yeah, so Charles Barkley and he's not just. He's not just some old guy that talks a lot of smack. I'm sure a lot of the younger viewers and the, the younger fans think that he was the original Zion. He was the original, the round mound of rebound. Anybody remember that? He's the guy that said that Moses Malone took him aside when he was a rookie, said, you're fat and you're lazy, get in shape. And that basically changed his career and changed his life, right? And so um, you look at uh, Zion and and uh, Charles Barkley and they're built pretty much uh, very similarly, um, undersized power forwards who were overweight early on, but both can jump out the gym, were amazing in the open court. But here's the difference. Here's the difference. You saw it in, in that clip I just showed. Barkley, he had a better post game. He had a better mid-range game. Maybe statistically he wasn't a better three-point shooter, but he made bigger um, three-point shots in terms of when they were needed. Um, he was a far superior rebounder. I mean, far superior. Zion averages 6.5 rebounds per game for his career with that body. And you know what that says to me? He simply doesn't want to do it 
He simply doesn't want to do it. You know, that that's all there is to it because I am uh, six feet tall, just six feet tall, not even six one. And when I was uh, growing up, my favorite player early on was Charles Barkley. And I, you see, I'm bald, but <laughs> this is funny. My boys always give me um, snap, uh, talk snap about me, about this to me. Uh, when I was like 16, I shaved my head because I wanted to be like Charles Barkley. And whenever I played ball, again, six feet. But guess what? I used to rebound like crazy. Why? Because I watched you box out and you have a desire to go get the ball. You can go get the ball. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, I was Dennis Rodman out here. But if you want to rebound, you can. So I say this to say there's no excuse, no reason whatsoever why Zion Williamson is not a better rebounder. Right? So you look at Barkley. And he averages more than 11 rebounds per game for his entire career, his entire career in a much better era for bigs, much tougher era, power forwards and centers with better rebounders and better bigs on the whole. Again, that's not my opinion. You can go look it up. I know someone's going to say, oh, name a big from back in the day was better than Jokic. We're not going to get into that. At some point, we're going to talk the Jokic thing. Oh, no. Oh, wow. Uh, I hope not. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that out. I don't. I don't have the game on right now while I'm while I'm uh, doing this live. But man, I, I hope not. Jeez. If he did, he is just cursed. But um, yeah. Back to back to Zion and Barkley. Um, so like, th- so this whole thing of we've never seen a player like Zion. Well, that's just ridiculous. Okay. Um, so it's the NBA though. And the NBA media is doing what it does and it's doing what it has to do. And that is use hyperbole to uh, boost up today's players, knowing that in some cases they're flat out lying. Now, I don't want to call anybody a liar, but to say we've never seen a player like Zion before, that is a flat out lie. I just demonstrated that to you, right? Okay, cool. Um, Back to Zion. What does his future look like? What does his future look like? The Pelicans made the playoffs. They're the number eight seed. They'll play Oklahoma City Thunder in the first round. Uh, By the way, if you just came into the chat, thanks for stopping in. Make sure you give us that like. um, uh, Stop in the chat. Leave a comment. Let us know where you're coming from. I appreciate it. But yeah, um, uh, Pelicans got the number eight seed. I'm not sure what Zion's uh, health going forward is looking like. If he's going to be back anytime in that series, we'll find out. Um, He went out in the first playing game against the Lakers. Um, He scored 40 and got 11 rebounds. So funny. I just sat here. Um, you know, barking on the dude for not rebounding enough. He got 11 rebounds in that playoff game and he got busy. Right. So this is so funny. One of the things I talk about and complain about all the time is lack of defense in the modern NBA. Zion Williamson is a left handed player, rarely goes right. He is a bull in the China shop, just looking to get downhill the majority of the time, takes the vast majority of his shots in the paint uh, pretty much at the rim. Everyone knows this, yet nobody can stop the dude. Uh problematic but whatever okay it's just modern nba right but anyway as for zion's future i think what his future is it's completely up to him does he want to do what it takes body wise and nutrition wise and conditioning wise to get where he needs to be to stay on the floor does he want to work on his game does he want to expand it to become a better player does he want to uh be able to go on the block and develop post moves Does he want to be able to become a better mid-range and three-point shooter? Does he want to uh, work and do what it takes to continue to develop as a point forward? And does he want to consistently be a better rebounder? Because if Zion wants to, he's going to be one of the best rebounders in the league. There's no reason why that dude shouldn't be getting double-digit rebounds. There's just not. Is he actually going to attempt to defend the basketball at any point in his career now i know it's still early but realistically early is when you should be playing defense the most because at that young age that's when you have all the energy that's when you have the legs the defense is going to slow down as you age totally get it but when you're young that's when you should be an animal a ball hawk on defense but if you don't want to play it you're not going to play it so i totally get it and again modern nba (laughs) they can say what they want but we know what it is Defense just isn't that important. I'm not going to say no one defends, but it's just not as important as it used to be. All right. So um, what I want to do now is I'm going to go ahead, open up the phone lines. And uh, if you want to give me uh, give me your take on Zion Williamson and what you think about uh, what his future holds and and what he can be, go ahead and uh, give us a call. Number is 904-219-8264. 904-219-8264. Go ahead. Give us a call. And uh, give me your thoughts on Zion Williamson. 
Um, I'll go ahead and wait a minute here, see if we got any calls coming in. And if not, then uh, we'll go ahead and take it to the next topic. We'll move it right along. Okay, looks like I don't have um, any calls on the topic. That's cool. So uh, we'll go ahead and we will move to topic number three. Kyrie Irving snubbed from the United States men's Olympic basketball team. Now, this one was interesting. And before we kind of start looking into why the snub happened, there's something I got to do here. There's something I got to do here. And I got to apologize. That's the first thing I need to do. And um it's my opinion. This is something I teach my son, and this is something I believe. If a man is wrong, a man must be accountable, and a man should be able to say I was wrong, and a man should be able to apologize to whoever it was that he offended if he was wrong. And so I'm going to do that right now, okay? Got new information, got to change it. So I was one of those people that, and if you go way back in this show, uh, maybe a year or two ago, nah, a couple years maybe, when he was still in Brooklyn, I was one of those people that drank the Kool-Aid and I called Kyrie Irving a cancer. Yes, I did. And um, I was listening to uh, the reports that Kyrie Irving didn't speak to teammates for this. This started, I should say, when I heard the reports that Kyrie Irving was in the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers locker room when he was still there and he didn't speak to teammates for weeks at a time. And I tend to go with what's reported generally because as a journalist, especially a sports journalist, if you're a beat writer or something like that, those things don't generally get made up, right? Things have to come from inside the building. You have sources, whether they're players, whether they're front office people, what have you. You generally have sources who are feeding you information. And if you are with any sort of uh, reputable organization, then you'll have an editor that generally is going to know who your sources are. You trust that. And that person is going to vet. And also you're going to do what's called double sourcing, right? You're going to look in all... Uh, wherever it's possible to try and have two sources to corroborate something. And so I generally tend to go with what's reported because I I believe in the journalistic tenets and hope that most of these uh, writers and reporters are upholding this stuff. And maybe they are, maybe they're not, but I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt because why? I went to journalism school and I, I know these kind of things, right? And I'm not saying that you had to go to journalism school to know this, but that's the general premise. And that's why I kind of have that, that outlook, right? So that said, I didn't take into account in this Cleveland Cavaliers situation, the nuance that was, that was involved in the Kyrie Irving allegedly not speaking to teammates for weeks at a time in the Cavs locker room. And what, what was some of that nuance? Okay. I didn't take into account the nuance that that was reportedly after finding out that LeBron James had tried to get him traded. Whoa, LeBron James tried to get a teammate traded. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> it's not about LeBron. Even after Kyrie Irving had saved LeBron in the 2016 finals, I don't care who gets mad. Yes, Kyrie saved him, where he averaged 27 points per game and made one of the biggest clutch shots in finals history to seal the deal. But as usual, LeBron gets all the credit. LeBron brought him back, blah, blah, blah. Was it an incredible series by LeBron? Absolutely. Did he do it by himself? No. But anyway, it's not about LeBron. This is about Kyrie. So then he moves on from Cleveland and he's in Boston. And there's reportedly issues in the locker room there. He's on that thing where he's on the floor in, in the TD Garden. And he's saying like, um, if you'll have me back, I'd love to resign here. And then the next thing you know, he's asking to be, I think he's asking to be traded or um, was he, was he traded or did he leave it a free agent? Regardless, he said he'd love to resign there. So I guess he left as a free agent and then he ends up going to Brooklyn. So I'm like, well, if you wanted to move on, that's fine because you have the right as a free agent to do so. But why would you stand in front of that crowd and say, you know, I would love to uh, resign here if you'll have me back. And then um, there were, again, more reports that there was stuff going on in the locker room with Kyrie, et cetera. So again, as a journalist, somebody who's been trained in this, I tend to uh, lean on the side of that beat reporter and that writer and say, OK, well, you're not just making this up. You had to have gotten this information from somewhere. But again, um, I'm just telling you what my thought process was at the time. I'm in the process right now of apologizing to Kyrie Irving for saying things that didn't need to be said and not giving him his due. OK, so now I'm hearing all this stuff from Boston and I'm thinking, 
Why do there seem to be issues wherever Kyrie Irving goes? That's weird, right? It's, uh, what is that, common denominator. Not a mathematician, but generally there's this thing called common denominator. And if you're always in the middle of something and things go bad, you're generally the common denominator, right? Okay, cool. Now, next up, he ends up in Brooklyn. And the biggest thing there was the whole vaccine mandate, right? New York City at the time, COVID, um, the COVID uh, pandemic and the, the vaccine mandate. And, okay, I never had too much issue over him not wanting to take the mandate other than I could look at it from both sides, right? There have been vaccine mandates from the beginning of our country, right? If you actually go back and look at it, there were um, mandated smallpox vaccines. Yes, this was happening back in the uh, late 1700s. So we've always had... Um, We've always had uh, uh, vaccine mandates in this country. So whatever. Um, but I never had too much issue over that. My bigger issue was that I felt like in some ways maybe he was letting his teammates down when they needed him. Because who knows if if Kyrie Irving is there, if these guys end up winning a championship that year that um, Giannis and the Bucks won it. Maybe, maybe not. OK, so anyway. Um, anyway, um, so let me clarify something, OK? It's widely held that Kyrie Irving, as a Muslim, he's a Muslim, he didn't take the vaccine because of his religion. So let me clarify something with you. I am a Muslim myself. And as such, and I'm someone who did get vaccinated against COVID. And that's another story, whether or not the vax was legit or whatever. I, I don't know. I got the vax. It is what it is. I'm not going to do revisionist history and go back and complain about it. It's done. Anyway, um, I can tell you that as a Muslim, I did the research and that multiple Islamic scholarly bodies throughout the world deemed that the vaccine was not haram, haram meaning forbidden for a Muslim or um, or that it, it was bad for them to take. Right. So the stance that he didn't take it because of his religion, I can tell you for sure that that stance is untrue. Now, if he had other stances, just, um, uh, you know, personal beliefs, et cetera, for why he didn't take it. That's fine. No problem with that. But just wanted to make sure that it's clear that everybody knows that that stance right there has nothing to do with Islam. So anyway, there's all of that right now, even through all of this with me having called Kyrie Irving a cancer. And again, I apologize for that. I did also acknowledge that he does tons of good work around the world. Um, he does work in his local communities, wherever he is. That's a fact. We know that he does work among the Native American communities in America as that is, you know, part of his own background genetically. I think his mom was Native American. Um, he has given his own money, if I'm not mistaken, to help get clean water to an Afghan village that didn't have easy access to it. So they like um, he helped to, you know, build a fountain and, you know, build what it what it take what it took to to get the clean water to that village. So these are all things that this guy does out of the goodness of his heart. And there's many more that I researched when I was reading about this, but I didn't want to just go down the line talking about all the great things Kyrie did, even though he does do a ton of great work. So um, I want to make sure that I acknowledge those things. Kyrie does a lot. So let me, let me take a second here after all of that background and say, Kyrie Irving, you will probably never hear this, but I owe you an apology for calling you a cancer without knowing the entire story. Kyrie Irving, I was wrong. And as a man, I have no problem standing up here and saying that I was wrong. I owe you an apology. Next time I, you know, say something like that about somebody, I will do my best to have done the background research on it first. And you didn't deserve me or anyone else for that matter, talking about you in that way. So, um, you know, if you ever hear this, please take my sincere apology. If not, I still need to get it out there. Maybe someone, um, you know, you know, or someone in your circle will eventually hear this, but I apologize. All right. So also, um, before I move on and continue talking about this Kyrie thing uh, and the Olympics, the Olympic snub, which is where this whole thing was really going. But I wanted to make sure I opened up by, you know, correcting some errors on on my part. I want to give a shout and really some appreciation to my main man, Mel at Man Down Sports for opening my eyes to a lot of that stuff, because, you know, I, I had beliefs on that. And um, and um. You know, he and I, we had we had a pretty good discussion about it. And he helped me learn that um, a lot of those things that I thought were the case were not the case. Um, matter of fact, here's Mel right here. Medical or religious exemption was the only request that the NBA or the military accepted. You got to choose one when you elect not to take take the jab. OK, yeah, that was interesting. But um, yeah. So, again, um, Mel, uh, like I said, thank you. I uh, appreciate you. Um, you. You definitely um, helped me to. Uh, see um, a lot of that stuff. So uh, appreciate that. But yeah, um, 
uh, back to uh, what we were talking about. Where were we? So uh, let's get back to the whole thing about the Olympics, right? So Kyrie Irving did get snubbed, in my estimation, for uh, the Olympic team. I think he should have been on that. And um, let's talk about that a little bit, right? So earlier this week, USA Basketball announced the 2024 uh, Olympic basketball lineup, and that's going to consist of the following. Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, Drew Holiday, Tyrese Halliburton, Joel Embiid, if he's healthy, Steph, Devin Booker, Bam Adebayo, and Edwards, Anthony Davis, and I think I missed Jason Tatum at the beginning, but the point is, and of course, LeBron, Did I, I'm sure LeBron was in there. I must have missed it, but anyway, the point is, um, I guess that they're trying to go over there and reclaim uh, basketball for the United States as the world has clearly caught up and almost completely, if not completely, closed the gap in terms of uh, the United States and the rest of the world in basketball, right? So Kyrie Irving was on the U.S. team that won gold at the FIBA Games in 2014. He was on the U.S. gold medal team in 2016. So again, why is he not on the team this time? Why is Kyrie Irving not on the team this time? So let's go back a little bit, right? So we know that if you don't have all the information on Kyrie, you can be a quote on he can be perceived as a quote unquote controversial figure, right? And so if if you really don't take the time to listen to what he says or to do the research, or if you don't have the opportunity to sit down and speak with him directly, um, or or you really don't have the opportunity to uh sit down and really listen to an interview that he takes with someone and uh, listen to what he has to say, then maybe you'll have some preconceived notions about the guy. And um, so here's my idea. I think the biggest reason that Kyrie Irving is not on the United States Olympic team is because of this. We know that Kyrie Irving is a highly principled guy. And we know that earlier this year, uh, he walked into one of the games wearing on his head, that's called a, a kafir. And he wore that going into the game and he wore it in the post game presser. And that is a headgear that is shown that generally shows uh, solidarity with the Palestinian cause. And so we know that I'm sure that is not at all going to be taken very well in uh, some international circles. Right. Kyrie Irving is known to be a vocal supporter of Palestine and the Palestinian cause. And um, he, like many people throughout the world, is unhappy with the Israeli treatment of Palestine uh, following the horrendous, heinous uh, October 7th attacks against Israel by Hamas, right? So that said, as much as terrorism can never be advocated, Israel's disproportionate response shouldn't be advocated either, and Kyrie is not having it. And so it's my opinion that the powers that be, right, Right, exactly. Um, man down, you, you're you just a step ahead of me. I'm sure Israel's made it known they would be angry if Kyrie played on Team USA. That's one reason you, you're a step ahead of me. Yeah, I was just saying, it's my opinion that um, the powers that be are very concerned that if he's on the national team and he gets a question from, you know, an international media body, he's going to say what he feels and it could spark an international controversy, which... It's funny because um, many countries and many people throughout the world are against what Israel is doing in the way they are conducting their war against, quote unquote, Hamas in uh, Palestine. And so um, the United States, clearly, they don't want to deal with any part of that. That's that was my uh, prevailing thought on why Kyrie Irving is not on this team. Um, Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid injured on dunk. Uh oh. OK, so anyway, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, this is frustrating, right, because uh, the powers that be are worried about politics in the Olympics, which is supposed to be a global celebration of sport and of the world. But I will say this, right, um, when Kyrie Irving, when they asked him about the snub after everything came out, um, I'm sure that he handled it in a way that was totally unexpected by them them being uh the the major media and in my estimation i think he handled it perfectly Let, let's hear what Kyrie had to say uh, i wish my brothers well and i just didn't fit into this team and i think the deliberation process was a tough one um but again i have nothing but respect for those guys over at usab um you know at this point in my career i, I think my focus uh should be on winning the championship and 
you know, in the summertime, just going to support those guys when I get a chance. Um, but yeah, uh, I grew up in a time too, I wanted to say this, I grew up in a time too where we actually had to try out for USAB and we did meet up as a group and as peers and there was a mutual respect that we earned from one another and trying out and then seeing what five meshed well. So I think obviously the timing's a little bit different, um, but yeah, I kind of miss those days of just being able to get everybody together um, break bread and then compete against one another and then the deliberation process happens at the end of like the four days or five day process even though people know who's going to be on the team you know what i'm saying so i just i miss that fun part of it of just uh getting together but i, I wish my brothers well and so i think maybe a lot of people did not expect Kyrie to respond in that fashion i don't know if maybe they thought that he was going to throw a fit or a tantrum or try to make a big deal out of it but he responded in a fashion I think that was very measured, very mature. Um, I don't even know if it was well practiced. It was just um, a, a very good, calm, measured, mature response. And he said exactly what should have been said. He handled that perfectly. And I'm sure maybe that even irritated some people who were maybe trying to get a little more out of him so that they could make a big deal and try to paint him in a bad light. And Sneed, you're definitely right. Um, he really does seem to be a very good dude and they are trying to blackball him. But I think he's in the right place. Um, Dallas is to some degree a major media market, more so for the Cowboys um, than than maybe for the Mavericks. But like he's not in New York because imagine if he was in New York and he went and he wore that kafir, right? That would have been a huge meltdown for a lot of people. It probably would have been either on the front or the back page of the Daily News or, or you know, the New York Post or what have you um, with some crazy headline because <laughs> New York is and really from a historical uh, context has been a, um, a home of uh, what's that um, yellow journalism since the 1840s. So they're big on that. But, but the point is um, he's in a place where he can more focus on just his, uh, his spiritual growth and, and playing basketball and trying to win. And I think that's a very good thing for Kyrie Irving. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, he didn't make the team. And I truly believe that politics are why, he didn't make uh, uh, USA basketball this time around, and it's dead wrong, just like I was dead wrong years ago when I said the things that I said about Kyrie Irving. And again, I'm going to just go out with this at the end of this segment once more. Kyrie Irving, if you hear this, I truly apologize for the things that I said about you. You didn't deserve that. I'm glad I was able to uh, be exposed to some things. And uh, keep doing what you're doing, my brother, and uh, just keep balling. Keep trying to be the best player you can be. Keep trying to be the best person you can be and continue to help people. All right. Um, that's uh, that's definitely um, uh, that that's going to be the end of the uh, Kyrie Irving topic. So what I want to do is um, I want to go ahead and I'm going to put the number up here. And if anyone has any commentary, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on Kyrie Irving, why you think he didn't make uh, the Olympic team. Um, maybe do you think politics was part of it? What do you think about his stance on Palestine and on other things? Um, go ahead. Give us a call. 904-219-8264. 904-219-8264. Go ahead. Give us a call. I definitely would love to hear from you on this topic before we get into our last one, before we get out of here. And that's going to be Paul Pierce and, whoo, and some comments he made the other day. All right. No calls on that topic. All right. Um, let's go ahead and. OK. Mel, what's going on, my brother? Well, I want to make a comment about Kyrie, man. First of all, that was commendable for you uh, to, you know, to acknowledge that you had to take a second look at all that and, and see that it was a little bit different than what you thought originally. That was dope. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate that. Yeah. But no, nah, uh, I, I think you hit the um, nail on the head, man. It's, it's a political move. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't even know if it's done out of animosity anymore. I, I think most of the things that was done against him in the past, like keeping him off the top 75 and, you know, uh, you know, some things like that, I think that was uh, maliciously done out of, out, of, out of some, you know, some, some anger against Kyrie. But I think now it's mostly died down. 
but now it's just them thinking like, I mean, the optics of it, uh, just having having him here because of the anti-Semitic stuff. Mm. So just just having him here is gonna cause more of a problem than we really gonna deal with, and uh, that that that's the issue now. Um, because this is this you know the picking the living thing. That's that's some high profile people that's, that that's involved with doing that. It ain't just like some 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 writers and some journalists. You get what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you're you're that, you're repping for the whole country, so. You know, right. now, now a lot of, yeah, to your point, a lot of high level people start getting involved. You're right. Yeah. But, but he still is going to get that low level animosity from journalists and stuff like that. Because, uh, um, like I see people make these top 100 lists, you mm-hmm. know, like the ringer and, uh, you know, uh, breach report and all that stuff. And you read those top 75 and they still have Kyrie ranked very, very low. Um, and when they explain why, it always has has to do with stuff that don't have anything to do with basketball. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, so the so the journalists are still holding a, a bit of a grudge, but I don't think that's a, that's at play with the Olympics. It's just it's just the optics and going to look good on a on a global scale. Well, well, I'll and say I'll this. Com- yeah, my bad guy. I t- I'll, I'll take that coming off there. I'll listen to the rest of it. Okay. Hey, I appreciate you calling, Mel. Thank you, brother. All right. No doubt. Yeah. No, I'll just say um in in response to what um uh, Mel had to say, um I think I think there's a lot of truth to what he said, but it's weird to me. Obviously, I don't work for any uh major media outlets, so I I'm not in a position to face the backlash, but I can say as someone who again is um trained as a journalist and got a degree in this and went to school for this and worked in journalism for a while, not currently working in journalism, but the fact is if I can come out here and say, "Hey, I was wrong." And, you know, I did some more research and found out some more things and what I thought wasn't the case. Like, I don't I never understood why it's so hard to do that. But I guess when you have uh, higher level external powers leaning on you, it's it's a lot harder maybe sometimes to try and do uh, the right thing, I guess. Um, but, yeah, um, thanks for calling, Mel. I appreciate you. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to move on to the final topic here. <laughs> this is a fun one. Um, so if you know me. You know, I'm a Boston Celtics fan, die hard. I say it all the time. I was a Boston Celtics fan when Larry Bird was waving his towel in the garden. Not when ML Carr was waving his towel in the garden. I'm not quite that old, but when Larry Bird was, right? That's when I first, first started getting into basketball, and I just thought that was cool. Um, So uh, Boston Celtics and uh, Paul Pierce is one of the greatest Celtics of all time, and obviously he is a Hall of Famer, and um, he's one of the probably a top 10 small forward of all time, maybe top eight, depending on how your list shakes out. I think we could probably get him in the top eight small forwards of all time. But anyway, um, Paul Pierce now has a podcast. And of course, he's on Ticket in the Truth regularly with uh, uh, Kevin Garnett, his former Celtics teammate and his friend. Um, But now he's got his own pod. Of course, everyone's got their own pod, right? The format podcast and everybody else. (laughs) But um, yeah, so he's doing his thing. And this is interesting, right? Because Paul Pierce um throughout a big part of his career basically from the time lebron entered well not the time he entered the league but um when paul pierce formed up with the uh big three in boston and lebron was really um moving into his physical prime uh he and lebron were big time rivals and so you didn't hear a lot of positive talk about lebron from paul pierce right because these guys were They were on the floor against each other. They were competing at an extremely high level. And from a physical standpoint, at the least, right, there's no reason that Paul Pierce should have been anywhere near LeBron. He should not have been able to compete with LeBron. Now, on an offensive toolkit, on a skill set, on a footwork, on a just on a quote unquote bag. I know LeBron hates hearing about a bag, probably because his bag is almost empty. But anyway, um, from a bag standpoint, Paul Pierce is far superior to LeBron James. Physically, no. Can he do like the physical things LeBron can do? And was he able to carry a team the same way? No, but Paul Pierce, he used to go at it with LeBron, right? And so um, obviously when uh, Pierce was uh, in Boston and LeBron was in Cleveland, um, he was doing his thing. And then, of course, uh, uh, LeBron went to Miami and Paul Pierce was still going at him. Now, by that time, um, it's funny because uh, at that time, I think the Celtics average age was 
34 and a half or 35 years old. And of course, the Heatles were all in their physical prime. So real, real, real quick side note there. It's always funny to me how uh, LeBron fans talk about how Michael Jordan had to wait till the Pistons got old to get past them. Hmm. So when when the Bulls broke through, the Pistons were an average age. And I probably said this on a few other shows before, but let me remind you, the Pistons were an average age of 29 years old. And when LeBron went and joined up with the Heatles and then got past the big three Celtics, the big three Celtics were an average age of 34 and a half, 35 years old. So how come we don't hear the same thing from LeBron fans about, well, LeBron had to not only go and join up with two other Hall of Famers, two other all pros in their primes to beat an old Celtics team. We never hear that. But anyway, that's a different story, right? We not even talk about that today. I just figured I'd throw it out there because, you know, I want to show you how you guys do anyway. Um, so Paul Pierce, one of LeBron James' biggest rivals, both with uh, Miami and with Cleveland. So those guys used to go at it, right? If you remember the 2008 playoffs, um, semifinals, game seven, uh, I think LeBron James had 45 points. Paul Pierce had 42. And it was one of those shootouts for the ages, right? If you ask me, it was right there with the legendary um, Larry Bird, Dominique Wilkins shootout in game seven of the Eastern Conference semifinals in 88, 87, 87 or 88. But the point is, it was one of those all time legendary playoff duels. And you love to see those. So anyway, Paul Pierce is now long retired. He is a Hall of Famer. He's an NBA analyst on Fox Sports 1. And of course, as I mentioned, he's a podcaster. And of course, LeBron James is still rolling along and he is continuing to set milestone after milestone and he is doing amazing things, right? Okay, LeBron fans, you heard that. LeBron is doing amazing things. I'm giving him credit. Okay, cool. So uh, Paul Pierce has been extremely critical of LeBron uh, throughout his career, both as a player and then uh, as a as a broadcaster after he retired. Now, this is interesting, right? Because all of a sudden, we're hearing the tunes of Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett change in regards to LeBron. Now, um, you guys heard Mel from the Man Down Sports podcast. He just called in a little while ago, and he was on the show um, a while back, maybe a month or two ago. And one of the things that I was talking to him about was kind of how these guys talk about the modern NBA once they retire. And one of the things he said is, and I'll never forget this because I, I hadn't really looked at it this way. Mel said, when you join the NBA media after you retire, you have a certain responsibility to help to grow the game. And I hadn't really thought about that. All I'm thinking about is, OK, you join the NBA media. You were a player. If you were a, an outstanding player, like a Hall of Famer type or whatever, just be honest and tell it how it is and really, you know, basically keep it a buck. Right. Not not act ignorant, but, you know, keep keep it 100 and tell it how it is and be honest about what you're seeing, what's going on, what's happening in the game, et cetera. And Mel told me, nah, you have a responsibility to help to grow the game. So you can't be but so honest about things. Right. And I was like, hmm, I hadn't looked at it that way. Right. So I guess in a way, almost that's a kind of nice way of saying that responsibility to help grow the game means that to some extent you also got to push the narratives. and. Uh, that's really got to suck if you know better than what you're saying, right? So um, Paul Pierce was on his podcast uh, earlier this week, and he said something that completely shocked me. Like, I get it. He's not going quite as hard as he used to. Um, no, did he? And, but I will say that I was totally shocked when he said this. Check it out, and we'll come back and talk about it. Yes, I, I said, look, if LeBron win a chip this year, undisputed goal, what you think about that? This year, as a team that's in a no, in a normal year without the plan, would not mm -hmm. make the playoffs. Can't if they, be the if he takes Sober. this, if he he can't be the goal. No, because Damn. this is why. This is why. It's like you, he can. His accolades will stand. He will be. He will be on the hill, and he's going to have so much things to say about his career. He's all Man, time. He's going to have so much things. But Jordan down. was another thing. He was so far, head and shoulders. He was like the truest thing we've had in sports, like Mayweather. Like when Mayweather said, if you're going to bet on me, you'll be rich by now. <laughs> yeah. You got to bet on Jordan every time. Yeah, Jordan was the truest thing we ever seen. Once he figured, first of all, Damn. look at his elevation. He, he elevated. He stayed with that franchise. He rode it. He rode it. He rode it. They got some young pieces. Look at Scottie Pippen got his trainer, so started working. If he bring, if he, he brings, lifted everybody. So, 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 like, damn, if you say LeBron brought a championship, he's already brought a championship to three franchises, which 
I don't know no other franchise player who's done that. Not a franchise player. Yeah, Players didn't move the round. Ain't nobody around. just like, as soon as he got there. It's a new thing. Contender. It's a new day. These guys, like what Kobe did to get his five, he breathed, he, he, he breathed life into this You got Kobe over LeBron? Yes. Ooh. I do. So I'm not LeBron, a numbers guy. So LeBron I watch not them. only can't be the GOAT, he can't be over Kobe. So no. where does that put Kobe in the conversation because this for, is why. for a GOAT? Let me tell you, this is how I, I don't do my GOAT on stats and all this. I do my stuff on if we line up, if we line up, who are you taking? If I does Kobe have up, an argument for GOAT? No. But if LeBron can't be the GOAT, but you argue, there's an argument for him with GOAT, but you have Kobe over LeBron, why doesn't Kobe have an argument for GOAT? Kobe is the greatest copycat artist of all time. Wow. So I heard these comments and I'm like, am I in like some bizarro world or something? Paul Pierce actually lobbying for LeBron James as the GOAT? Like, I really could not believe it. Paul Pierce, he started out and he started off by admitting, you know, he's been a big LeBron critic. Maybe not in that particular clip, but um, earlier on, he, he said it. He's been a big LeBron critic. And so I'm sitting here and I'm listening. And then the more I listen and the more I think about it, process it and try to figure out how am I going to address this? It's going to make a great podcast topic and all that. That's when I thought about what my man Mel said. And that is, again, that you have a responsibility to help grow the league, which is weird, though, because at this point, LeBron is on his way out. So why is why is pushing the narrative, which in my estimation is a faulty narrative? And there's a lot of easy ways to demonstrate that. But why is pushing that narrative? helping the league grow when LeBron's on his way out. Like, if you want to talk about, talk about one of the younger players, talk about, you know, obviously he's not in the GOAT discussion, but a, a Wemben Yama who clearly is, is, a, is a total freak or, you know, some of the Ant Edwards or some of these other guys. But, yeah, um, so Paul Pierce saying that, I, again, I was totally shocked by it. So um, <clears throat> this is the thing. So I'm, I'm listening to uh, this stuff about LeBron becoming a GOAT. So now the latest argument is, should LeBron win this championship, championship number five, that would be 11 trips to the finals. And he would still be under 500, mind you, still under 500. I don't know how or why we keep managing to gloss over that, but he'd still be under 500, which means he's lost more times than he's won on the biggest stage, more finals losses than any other MVP. But anyway, that is what it is. So here's the deal. When it comes to the LeBron James GOAT arguments, why do we keep changing what the quote unquote criteria is. We've never seen this with anyone else, right? Who are uh, probably the only other two guys that were legitimately in the greatest of all time arguments. Well, I guess if you're older, you will probably say Wilt or maybe Oscar. I've heard Oscar from some of the older people, but probably Wilt. And for me, as amazing as he was, he's disqualified for the same reason LeBron is. He's two and four in the NBA finals, right? So when you lose that much more than you win on the big stage, that's a problem for me. So I can't have you there. So there's Oscar. Uh, I'm sorry, there's Wilt. And uh, there's Michael Jordan and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? And so these are the other guys in who would likely be in the GOAT discussion. And so the arguments for LeBron, like the goalposts keep moving, and I can't figure out why. So first, it was obviously, you know, he's got tremendous ability, blah, blah, blah. So you got to win championships. OK, so he won championships, but we ignore the losing. So I, I don't know how that worked. I just talked about it. So then there's, oh, well, uh, he's got to be the GOAT. And he said it himself because he came back from one three down against Golden State in the 2016 finals. Now, no one is ever going to get me to believe that that stimulus package the NBA gave gold uh, Cleveland with the BS Draymond suspension did not play a massive role. That series was going to be over in five had Draymond not been suspended. And I think anyone who knows basketball knows that, but the NBA, you know, they're like, come on, man, we can't, we can't let that go like that. Don't get me wrong. Draymond, <clears throat> he allowed himself to get uh, suckered into a position where he could do something stupid and then get suspended, especially when he had, you know, narrowly missed getting suspended uh, throughout um, earlier in the season, earlier in the playoffs. But anyway, so there's that coming down from one to three that supposedly made him the GOAT. Um, then there's uh, becoming the all time scoring champion and passing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the, in the NBA. So this is interesting because I, I did a show about this a couple of weeks ago. 
I never heard anyone who says that LeBron is the GOAT because he's the scoring champion say the same thing about Kareem. So I'm wondering, how is it that when Kareem was a scoring champion, most of these people who call LeBron the GOAT weren't calling Kareem the GOAT. They were calling, they were finding some other reason to say that LeBron was the GOAT. But then when LeBron passed Kareem, all of a sudden that makes him the GOAT, okay? Then there's uh, LeBron is the all-time leading scorer in professional basketball history past the great Oscar Schmidt. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Um, LeBron James, uh, again, I don't say this to take anything away from it. It was an incredible, incredible accomplishment, and he is still putting distance between himself and the number two people, whether it's in the NBA or whether it's uh, in professional basketball, period. And I am sure he is very intent on trying to put all these stats out of reach. Um, stat padding, you call it what you want to, but at the end of the day, he's doing it. And then uh, LeBron fans are saying, well, he's the GOAT because he's the first to get 40,000 points, 11,000 rebounds, 11,000 assists. Those, again, absolutely phenomenal, incredible numbers. But when did purely statistical accomplishment make someone the GOAT? I, I don't really get that because if you want to talk stats making someone the GOAT, then let's go back to the old guy, Wilt, who still owns, um, I want to say, uh, 74 Seventy-four records in the NBA record book, and like seventy of them or sixty-eight of them are individual, and so just a few of them are shared. So if you want to talk statistical accomplishment, it's either Will Chamberlain or Michael Jordan or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So again, now now stats make LeBron the goat. Okay, now we're hearing Paul Pierce saying, "Well, if he wins that fifth championship, well, that's what's that's what's going to make him the undisputed goat." <laughs> How is this working? I just want to know, how is this working? We have never seen this type of goalpost moving before. I don't understand how, I don't understand why everything has to change and shift and move for LeBron, whether it's his rosters, whether it's the reasoning, whether it's the argument for why or what or how he's the GOAT. I don't think he's the GOAT, but you get the point. Why, why does this work that way? We've never seen it work that way for anyone else. Doesn't that tell you something? Doesn't that tell you very simply that he's not what they're trying to tell you he is? They're trying to sell you a bill of goods? I just don't get it. Um, you look at the Kareems and the Kobe's and the Michael Jordans, right? To me, the biggest difference between LeBron James and those guys is that those guys tried to master the game, master themselves, master their skill sets, and master the game. And now... LeBron, it seems to me, has tried to think about every possible way to get there without mastering the game, whether, like we said, whether it's the statistical achievements, whether it's stacking teams to try to win championships and grease the skid. He's, he, it seems like he's trying to find every way around it besides actually locking in and becoming the best possible basketball player. Because when Kareem tried to become a work to become the best possible basketball player, what did that end up with? Ten trips to the finals and six championships and uh, six MVPs, right? Michael Jordan tried to become the greatest basketball player that he could be. And what did that end up with? That ended up with six NBA finals trips, six championships, six finals MVPs, a defensive player of the year, 10 scoring championships, blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on. Kobe tried to become the best player he could be. It, it started out somewhat as mimicking Michael Jordan. But why was he mimicking Michael Jordan? Because Michael Jordan was the best. So he said, if I mimic this guy and I master myself and master what he mastered, then I can be the best because I believe I can outwork him, right? So there's that. And what did that lead to for Kobe? That led to five championships, that led to an MVP, that led to a few scoring titles, that led to nine times first team all NBA defense, blah, 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 right? So all of these things, if you just master yourself and try to master the game, everything else will come along with you. You didn't hear any of those guys trying to control the media spin and trying to uh, have the media uh, play the role to, to tell everyone how great they were. You didn't have them out here telling everyone how great they were, so on and so forth. All that wasn't necessary because why? They focused on mastering the game. And if you master the game, everything else comes along, right? They didn't try to win by stacking the deck. They didn't try to win by controlling the media. They didn't try to uh, stick around to accumulate stats, right? They just tried to become the best player possible and letting the chips fall where they may because they knew that if they did that, at the end of the day, they would be satisfied with where history placed them. That 
is the difference between LeBron and those guys. So he may have a bunch of finals runs and he may have four championships and he might even get five. I don't think so, but it's possible. And he has a bunch of incredible stats that maybe in their totality, no one will ever reach or no one will ever surpass. And he's got an all-time, all-time great career. You won't hear me argue that. You've never heard me argue that. But the majority of current NBA players still believe Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. So what does that tell you? What does that tell you? All right. So uh, before we get out here, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I would love to hear from anybody on this who um, wants to talk about uh, Paul Pierce and his thoughts on LeBron James and if he wins a fifth championship this year, especially coming from being that number seven seed and uh, winning that and uh, having to be in the play-in, which says, uh, what did Paul Pierce say? That uh, if there wasn't a play-in, they wouldn't even have made the playoffs this year. So if he should come up and lead that team to a championship, then he's the greatest player of all time, which oddly enough, I don't even know how that would be the case because Anthony Davis is the best player on that team, but so be it. But I would love to I would love to hear um, what anyone has to say about that. The number is 904-219-8264, 904-219-8264. I'm going to uh, give a couple minutes and um, hopefully I get some call in. I want to hear from some LeBron fans on this, really. If there's any LeBron fans in the chat, please call me and, and give me your thoughts on what I had to say. Give me your thoughts on what Paul Pierce had to say. I definitely want to hear from you. And uh, if not, then we'll go ahead and get out of here. But in, in the interim, I will go ahead and uh, just wait a couple minutes and hopefully I get a couple calls on that because I definitely want to hear from you. No LeBron fans want to go at me tonight? Come on now, where are you? Where are you? A lot of you have some interesting things to say in the comments when I uh, post these videos on YouTube. I would love to hear from you. Where are you? Where are you? Come on now. All right, well, I guess that's going to be it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get out of here. Uh, thanks so much for those of you who joined me. I appreciate you. If you haven't already, please go ahead and make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel and give me that like. And uh, if you got anything to say, leave it in the comments section. I try to get back to every comment I possibly can. So I definitely want to hear from you. Obviously, I'll be uh, dropping new videos again during the week. Um, I'm going to cut this one up. So um, if you don't want to watch the entire thing, you can get um, just the different segments. But um, I'll also be, as I said, dropping other videos during the week. Thursday, we do Throwback Thursdays and talk about some players from previous eras, whether it's football or basketball, um, maybe even boxing or what have you. Um, and uh, any other sports stories that come up in during the week, I definitely try to get on those. But I will be back. Uh, actually, I won't be back um, next Saturday night. Definitely got a family thing going on. So uh, no live show next Saturday night, but I will try to get out as much content as I can this week prior to that. So, yeah, I guess that's it. I'm not hearing from anybody. So thanks for joining me once more. And uh, that's it. I'm out. Peace.